My name is Leila Kosadi, and I am a board member for the Harvard Iranian Alumni Association. The Harvard Iranian Alumni Association is a nonprofit that's dedicated to bringing our community together and celebrating our community with events like this one, as well as our flagship summit program and our scholarship program as well. Um, so you're on call right now with a bunch of the members of our board, as well as our incredible panelists. But before I introduce our panelists, I want to just talk about a feature that many of you have already seemed to figure out about this um, session. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a box that says Q and A. If you click on that box, you can submit questions to ask any of our panelists, um, as well as give thumbs up to other people's questions. Please remember that if you do submit a question to be kind and considerate and respectful to our panelists, they have been so kind to donate their time to us. So we wanna make sure that we give them equal kindness in return. And we will move into Q&A at the second half of this session. Great, so with all of that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce all of our incredible panelists. They're very accomplished, so for the sake of time, I shorten their introduction. So be sure to follow all of them on social media to stay up to date with their work right after this panel. Awesome, so our first panelist is Maz Jobrani. He could mostly, most recently be seen starring in the CBS show, Superior Donuts. Maz that, got canceled. that got canceled. That got canceled. Most recently. <laughs> way, to, way to hurt his feelings there. Oh, yeah, I'm out of here. This, is, this is the biggest bunch of BS I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm out of here. <laughs> Let me try again. Let me try again. <laughs> no, just keep moving. Go to negative. <laughs> Maz negative. has a special on Netflix, Immigrant, which was filmed at the prestigious Kennedy Center. He also has multiple Showtime specials, including Brown and Friendly, I Come in Peace, and I'm Not a Terrorist, but I played one on TV. He also published a book with that same name that became an LA Times bestseller. Maz is also the star, co-writer, and co-producer of the award-winning indie comedy, Jimmy Bestwood, American Hero. Currently, you oh. can hear Maz on his podcast, Back to School, where professors, experts, and successful people from all walks of life come in to educate Moz on a variety of subjects. Wow, how do I find this guy? Where, where did, how, <laughs> this guy sounds very interesting. Keep going, move to Nagin, keep going. <laughs> Our go. next panelist, Nagin Farsad, has been named one of the 50 funniest women by the Huffington Post. Nagin is the director and producer of The Muslims Are Coming, a feature film starring many prominent comedians such as John Stewart. She is the author of How to Make White People Laugh, a book that was nominated for the Thuber Prize for Humor and recommended by Oprah Winfrey. She is the creator and host of the podcast Fake the Nation, and she is currently a TED Fellow, a program that convenes young world changers, academics, and trailblazers who have shown unusual accomplishment and exceptional courage. Okay, all right. She also has a book. Hold on. She has a movie, Negging. What's the name of the movie? It was a great movie about when there was a blackout. Oh, Third Street Blackout. Third, Third Street Blackout. How do Which people find actually, Third Street Blackout? You know, the, we were gonna, we were trying to get Maz to do that, but he was unavailable. And so really? we ended up with John, and then you ended up do, and then John Hodgman ended up doing that part. So, so what's, what's, uh, what's, how do people find it? You can actually, it's, um, it's on Amazon, but we made it free during the pandemic. So you could go to uh, thirdstreetblackout.com slash stream and watch it for free. Uh, it's actually a great movie, are, especially right now, like, it, because it was about the, the New York blackout, but now it, it's very, I, I thought it was great. So thank you, Maz. Yeah, now it's a downgrade in chaos. Like, blackout <laughs> was like a big, but now it's Corona. So look at my <laughs> Amazing. Um, finally, Tehran is a DC native. Yo, we don't need my bio because obviously everyone else was super accomplished. Oh, yeah. you are also, let me finish, let me finish. A DC native who moved to LA to pursue his dream of comedy. Tehran is the creator and host of the longest running Middle Eastern comedy show in the world, The Comedy Bazaar, and he also hosts Tehran's Back Thursday. Both are featured at the Laugh Factory. He was also the co-creator and co-host of the wildly popular podcast, Imperfect Gentlemen. He has starred in Jimmy Bestwood and can be heard as a regular guest on Maz's Back to School podcast. Welcome, Maz. He's, no, he's a co-host. He's a co-host. Co-host. Co <laughs> yeah, but I did, I'm a co-host on the podcast, but definitely did not star in Jimmy Bestwood. I had one part and it was, <laughs> a, a, I felt like a star. Listen, I felt like you were a star. You, I felt like you were a star too. 
<laughs> yeah, Ron, then let me, let me give the first piece of advice to everyone on this right now. There are no small roles, only small actors. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Go on. Strong. Strong. I think Go one on. thing that you forgot from all of our bios is that none of us went to Harvard. None of us went to <laughs> Just for the record. No, but the, you guys did much cooler things. All right, so. But I have a, I have a friend named Howard. And <laughs> that counts. That close. counts. Yeah. Um, great. Well, let's start with the basics. Many people wanted to know how all of you came into comedy, uh, maybe some obstacles that you faced, or even some good advice that you got along the way. Uh, Maz, why don't you start? Well, the biggest obstacle were my parents. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Um, yeah, I think as you know, I always say this, I don't think, I don't think Iranians are, are unique to this. I think a lot of immigrants face that from their parents. So at a young age, I was a big fan of Eddie Murphy's. I wanted to be an actor, a comedian, all of the above. And when I was 12 years old, I started doing musicals and I loved being on stage. I wanted to be like Eddie Murphy. I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. And my parents would come to the plays and What's interesting is I actually did a pretty good job at it because I, I was like, oh, I'm alive on here. So the things I loved doing was soccer, baseball, and being on stage. And uh, my parents would come and the, 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 the director of the play, her name was Shirley Bonbright. At the time, I was a backup dancer. It was seventh grade, so it was a musical. So I was just in the background dancing, but they taught us, they said, when you're in a musical, you gotta always be smiling when you're dancing. So I learned to do that. And um, some of the other kids, you know, weren't doing it. And I showed up one day, I was a little under the weather. I go, Miss Bombright, I was under the weather, but I decided to come today anyway. So we're rehearsing and I'm singing and dancing and smiling. And she stops the whole thing. She goes, everybody stop. She goes, look at him. He's singing, he's dancing, he's smiling. You should learn from him. And it was a moment where I was like, oh my God, I'm good at this. And then I get into high school and I'm doing plays and my parents come see the play and the director goes, hey, your son's good at this. You know, he could do this professionally. And my parents would be like, okay, thank you, thank you. And then they'd be in the car. And my dad would be like, that woman is crazy. You're not doing this BS. <laughs> so that was the, the biggest obstacle. It wasn't until I was in my mid twenties at the age of 26, when I realized you live one life, you should live for your, you should live your life for you, what you want to do. You shouldn't live your life to please your parents. Mm -hmm. And I know some of the parents right now are like, that's enough, Moz. Layla's parents, Layla's parents are like, hey, Moz, I craft you, yeah. turn it off. Yeah. Dad, Dad, you friend. couldn't see it was under the table. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would advise anybody, if you have any passion, whatever that is, to just jump into it, because you're not, you know, you're not getting any younger. And don't do anything to please your parents. Don't do anything to please society. Don't do anything because we all get caught up, especially in our culture. There's a lot of like all and you got to look good for the community and do something that has a title. That's all a bunch of BS. Do something you love and you'll do it well. That's it. Great. Nagin, what about you? How did you get into comedy? Well, I mean, I actually, what, I mean, I wanted to go into politics when I was little. I, I was like, you know, I remember when I was 11 years old, I walked into my parents' bedroom and I was like, I'm going to be the first Muslim president. Um, and then Barack Obama beat me to it. So anyway, but hey, <laughs> come on. Anyway, it's stupid. He's not Muslim. Um, he's just like a little Muslim though. Um, and, uh, and I was really working towards that. Um, you know, uh, and I, I ended up, um, you know, going to Cornell and, uh, and then Columbia for public policy. So I was like very serious about it. I, you know, um, I interned for Hillary Clinton and for Charlie Rangel and I was like, and C-SPAN not to brag. And, um, and so I was like really in, uh, and I, I had a, a, a career job as a, a policy advisor for the city of New York. Um, so, you know, in many ways, I was en route uh, to like having that political career that I wanted. But on the side, I was always doing comedy. And um, when I was in high school, I did my first play. 
um, as a sophomore. And I remember um, I was, uh, I was, there was, it was a musical like Maz, it was a musical and it was called Once Upon a Mattress. And, um, and I was cast as, uh, well, not Kitchen Wench number one or Kitchen Wench number two, but I was cast as Kitchen Wench number three. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I gotta be honest, I fucking killed and um, and I remember like just being on stage and not unlike Maz, I remember that feeling when people were laughing, um, you know, because like a lot turns on Kitchen Wench number three, as you can imagine. Um, but I had a bunch of like, like a few of, the, of these moments where the audience like really lost it. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I can say anything right now. They are fully listening to me. You know what I mean? And so I had this, a little bit of a dictatorial, like a Mao Zedong moment where I was like, this is power. Um, and then I want, and so I, uh, and it was just addictive, right? Like getting that laugh and, um, and then I, and then I just kept doing it. So I was doing it on the, on the side in college and on the side is like kind of diminishing. It was really just half the time doing comedy and then half the time going after politics and, um, and even in grad school, like people would form study groups and shit like that. And, and I would be like, oh, that's cute. I have a set to do downtown, so I'm gonna go. Like it was, I had one foot out the door the whole time. Uh, and then eventually, um, you know, my friends staged an intervention and they were like, you wanna be a comedian, snap out of it. So uh, that's kind of what happened. Tehran, what about you? How was your journey? Maz, Maz gave me that same speech, that same BS speech he just gave all of you <laughs> on my life. It was literally, I, and you guys think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I, I didn't start on this path, you know. I, I love Negging's story. It was very, like, strong, and I understand exactly what she means because the stage is very addictive. I think all three of us, uh, I know for a fact, Maz and I, we live for the stage. In fact, we just did a Laugh Factory Zoom uh, IG live thing today from the Laugh Factory with no audience just because we have a point of view and we love to love to get it out there and tell these stories. I was actually down the road similar to Negin. I love how she dropped all her Ivy League stuff. It was popping. I, I, was, <laughs> I got a degree in international politics and communications and then uh, economics and then was getting a law degree and then I was doing these events in DC and Maz had me basically open up for him, host a show for him. And afterwards, he gave me the speech where he was like, Tehran, you're good. But if you really want to do this, just being good, this is a hobby, then you should stop. You have to immerse yourself into this life, move to LA and make this happen. And my dad hates Maz for that because I came out here and didn't become a doctor. I was never going to be a doctor. Both my sisters are doctors, but I didn't, and now I do this, and I should have listened to my bubba because doctors live in much nicer houses, but I'm, I'm doing very well, thankfully, because of people like Moz, and I live very decently, and now I'm here. And Taron, do you have any advice that you would give people who are trying to be comedians like you all? I definitely have advice, and it's actually, I'm gonna mimic a lot of things that Moz is gonna say, uh, because a lot of my advice comes from Moz, and, and so forth but a lot of it has to do specifically is this is something going on with my screen <laughs> i think something is uh let me someone someone is sharing their screen oh with someone us. Whoever, we're, we're, we're a board member we're good whoever shared about, their screen whoever shared their screen was very brave what were you gonna say about to pull up a she was about to pull up a powpoint on your presentation <laughs> 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 write your advice down and send notes to everyone afterwards uh, harvard harvard alumni we get it um <laughs> the, the concept is first of all is uh if you have a dream differentiate between a wish and actual a uh, dream, meaning this, meaning a wish is when people, and I get this all the time, where people tell me, oh, I want to do this. I want to be a rapper. I want to be an actor. I want to be a comedian, whatever it is. And it's usually in these lofty dreams, right? The concept is, don't just tell me that. And if I say, okay, well, do you have a mixtape? Do you have a website? Do you have any of these little things that take you? And they're like, no, then you just wish you were whatever it is that you're saying you are. 
in order to actually want it, you have to do it. Practice makes perfect. Get on stage. If you want to be a comedian, develop that. It's a, it's, it's a muscle. When we go on stage, when Maz or Negin or anyone goes on stage, they make it look very easy because they've worked so hard at it. So make sure that you, you practice, you take it seriously, and you dedicate to it. This isn't an A to Z situation. Becoming a doctor is not easy, but it is very simple. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. You go to college, you take your MCATs, you go to med school, or you go to the island if you're not that bright, and then you come back, you do residency, you do residency, and then you become a doctor. Well, what I do, and obviously what Maz does, there was no A to Z. You don't just get to do these steps. You do everything, work extremely hard, dedicate to your destiny, and not only just hope for the best, but know that if you're prepared and you're ready, opportunity will always make you look extremely lucky. Great. Yeah, I saw Nagin and Maz both nodding along there a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how you guys view like the role of comedy. So Nagin, in your work, you often touch upon sort of how comedy intersects with justice. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that, how you view comedy as a sort of conduit for change. Um, like it feels sort of like in the last four years, what comedian doesn't see comedy as a conduit for change, you know? Uh, it's, um, it's like a good place to put your frustrations uh, that is like a little less terrifying uh, than the PBS news hour. But um, I think, you know, in the early days of what, what happened for me was really just that I really wanted to be a public servant. Um, I really sort of felt guilty about not pursuing a career in public service. And um, as a result, you know, I would, I would vacillate between jobs you know, I remember one of my first writing jobs was at MTV and like I walked in, um, I would walk into the writer's room and they'd be like, we need 25 jokes about Justin Bieber's abs by 1 p.m., you know? And that was like what I would do for money. And then to just balance that out and make myself feel a little less like horrendous, um, I would do stuff that I, that, you know, um, and highlight issues that mattered to me, whether it was Islamophobia, or you know, immigrant rights, or big banks, or you know, universal health care, whatever. Um, and um, yeah, and I just continue to do that. It does feel like comedy is just more disarming. You know, most um, one of my more recent projects, I went to um, Charlottesville with this was with MoveOn.org, and we you know did these huge. We put up these um, billboards that were like that said stuff like you know, um, the, the Trump winery where every bottle has hints of racism or whatever. So like we would advertise um, for the Trump winery and the Trump hotel in like ridiculous ways to get people to, to boycott. It was the, the project was called Boycott Bigotry and we put up ads and we also uh, had ads in the newspapers and blah, blah, blah. We made a splash, we did shows. And, um, you know, and I, I met so many like, red state Trump fans there that I had conversations with who were just like, they just couldn't handle the fact that it was a pleasant conversation with a liberal, you know what I mean? It was, and so I think just the act of being like a fun comedian when you're in a, in a conflict situation um, is disarming for people. And I feel like it helps kind of open the conversation instead of close it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Maz, do you have any reactions to that? I know you talk a lot about being in like your identity and you even have a show called Immigrant. Um, how do you think your identities have kind of shaped the ways maybe you view comedy or even maybe people's response to your comedy? Well, you got to have a point of view in comedy. So, I mean, there are some people that are really good joke writers and um, they, like Negan said, you, you work for some show and they say write jokes for someone else's voice but for you as a comedian if anybody here is thinking oh i want to be a comedian or i want to be a uh, uh write screenplays or i want to be a director or i want to make movies i want to make music whatever it is the more you can put your find your point of view and it takes time 
I've always said when you when you go on stage, you got to go on stage five to ten years until the voice you are on stage gets closer to the voice you are off stage, and then suddenly you start saying things off stage. You're like, oh, that could just go right on stage, because at first you feel like you need to portray yourself in a specific way, or you're emulating people that you watched growing up. So you're like, oh, I'll be on, I'll be like Eddie Murphy or whatever, and and this goes for directors and writers and stuff too, but the more you have a point of view, the, the more people will, um, you know, come to watch you. And I think that a, a big part of my identity, at least, had been growing up Iranian in America. So I talk a lot about that. But then as I grow as a comedian, I also grow as a person. So then I have a wife, I have kids. So now I'm talking about wife and kids. Now I'm getting older. I talk about getting older. So nowadays my show will encompass a lot. And also I realized it's not just the Iranian experience, it's an immigrant experience. So that's why like on, on the special immigrant, I go to the audience, I go, who else is here? There's Chinese people, there's Pakistanis, there's Indians, there's everybody's out there. Um, so no matter what your experience is, you bring your point of view. And I think the more you talk about you, the more people relate to you. So we realize we all have a lot in common. There's been so many times I've not seen a movie or I've seen a comedian and they've talked about their dad or their mom or their brother or their sister or their teacher. And I go, oh my God, I had that exact same thing. So talk about you, put yourself out there, be vulnerable, be willing to share. I think a lot of people, especially on social media, they're so concerned about the right lighting and the right presentation. And look at me, I'm bling bling, I'm in front of a Ferrari. Nobody cares. I'd rather see you in front of a scratched Ferrari and go, look, I bought a Ferrari and like an idiot, I scratched it. Go, oh, I can relate to that. Amazing. And I wonder how much of that, like how much of your delivery and, and everything changes when you switch platforms. Like Maz, you and Tehran just did today um, a stand-up special with the Laugh Factory. Tehran, maybe can you speak a little bit to how your delivery changes when you switch platforms, whether it's something virtual, like the Laugh Factory, um, or even like on a podcast and so on? Well, it's interesting because when we're at the Laugh Factory performing, we're performing in front of no audience. We adhere to quarantine and all the regulations. And what we have found is that when a singer goes on stage, a singer might have a band or uh, a guitar or something to accompany them. Well, for us as comedians, it's the audience. The audience is a huge vital part. It's the arrangement, it's the music that we sing to. The audience is, if not as much, even more so an important part of comedy. And without that audience, sometimes as comedians, we feel like we're not getting the same connection. We're not getting any connection, which is even why when people do IG Live, they tend to speak to the comments. And even us, when we're speaking here, we're speaking directly to each and every one of you. Well, since Maz and I have done several Zoom shows, we realized that the online platforms do give us a chance. Zoom, we can see your faces, does give us a chance. It's not the same. It's not the same at all. But there is a feeling of it. It's like, yeah, I'm not getting my, my Maman Bozorg's Gorma Sabzi at this <laughs> restaurant, but it's still Gorma Sabzi. Like, at least we're getting the taste, right? And sometimes it's not as good, obviously but it is what we have and it is what we need right now. Wait, but when you guys are doing the, um, the Laugh Factory shows, aren't there like, the, you're in the room, right, with other comedians? So other comedians tend not to laugh at each other. Right. Maz has a great I've laugh. Been, I've been oh, I've been doing like more laughs for you know. Maz and I both do. Wait, wait, don't tell me. And I, my laugh, Nagin Farsad laugh track has like increased exponentially just so that like that the other comics don't feel this horribleness of like the void. You know, I don't know. Uh, so are the comics? No, not it's not no. no a lot. When Maz is in the room, I'm a laugher. Maz is a laugher. I'm actually, to be honest, I'm not even a laugher. I fake a lot of laughs. Maz is an actual laugher. It makes me laugh, so that's very easy. Um, you get a lot of this. When you're a comedian, this is, this is how you know a comedian thinks you're great. Huh. And this is how you know, this is how a comedian, you know you've killed for a comedian. I should have thought of that. That's when you just said something that was so hilarious that 
the comedian, that's how it works. So with the other comedians, there's only usually like two or three at the most other people. So it's not, it's clearly not the same as when Laugh Factory is sold out on a Friday or a Saturday or on my show every Monday and Thursday, whatever. It's not the same. (laughs) I think the Zoom shows, the thing I figured out on the Zoom shows, you need, because somebody, I was hesitant at first, and then someone said, just get up there, talk about your experiences, what's going on. I think people are a little more forgiving right now. People in, the, in their homes watching or sitting on their couch going, oh, I wonder what's going on here. Let me see if it's entertaining. So that encouraged me to do it. And then Tehran and I did a few, and it, and it ended up being very fun because while you do it, you have the camera, you can play to like moving too close, moving far back, all that stuff. And you can also do the crowd work and you can also talk about your experiences. So that was all fun. And you leave on out of like, we did one, there was like 400 people on there and we left about 20 audio uh, audios on. And that way you could hear the laughter that was great. I felt like we figured it out because that allows you to stop and now you're talking to somebody and you're like, yeah, by the way, and you riff, blah, 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 blah. The one at the Laugh Factory that we did, this is my first time doing it today, but Tehran's been doing it. They just have a camera on you from the back of the room and there's like Tehran said, three or four people sitting there. You're counting on the comedians and whoever else is in the room to laugh for you. The problem becomes, and Tehran can, is, can um, testified to this as, as well. I showed up for the first time. And as soon as I got there, I'm just used to like sitting in the back when a comedian's on and just going through my phone. So I'm going through my phone. and I was like, Oh, pay attention. Pay attention. I was like, ha ha. And then I'm like, oh, bored. I'm back here. And I was telling actually the other guy that was on there, Boston. Guys, Music, you're revealing that, yourself to be a real dick right now. Kind of. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not the dick part. It's the attention span. I don't have the attention sure. span to pay attention. So unless if there's a crowd and we're all laughing together. So I was telling Bassem Youssef, who was on with us today, I'm, I'm going to talk to the owner of the club as well. I think what they should do is they should either find a way to allow some of the audience to laugh with us, or they should put the comments up, let us react to the comments, because what happens is obviously there's gonna be a lot of bad comments, and I, I thrive on some of those. Like when I do my Instagram live, some people are like, be funny, you know, they, they go F you, whatever, and I go, no, F you, and I lose my mind in a fun and funny way. And then you have your fans that are there, and they're saying funny things, and it allows you to kind of feel like there's people watching, but I do feel Given where we're at, there is a way to do comedy shows, and we're going to continue to do these through Zoom. Like Negan, you could totally put it out there and have two, three hundred people on, and just turn on ten of them and do the jokes, and they'll laugh, and it's a great thing. Great. Well, speaking of audience, um, let's move on to some of our audience questions. Ava, do you want to take over? You know, I might actually punt this one to Ariel. I know he has a burning question on. <laughs> <laughs> By putting on the spot. All right, I need to ask all three of you. This is a real problem for uh, Iranian Americans. You know, this generation where a lot of us are not dating or married to other Iranians, and there is a problem that comes up, which is how do you explain what an oftaba is to <laughs> your non-Iranian significant other? All three of you, please help me out with this. My, my wife, for the last 10 years, I've tried to explain it to her. <laughs> it's like the Persian bidet. <laughs> and then they're like, what's a bidet? Um, <laughs> no, it's funny because when I had boyfriends, you know the boyfriends that you bring home that you're like, this one's not gonna last, but I'm gonna let my parents suffer through this experience anyway. Um, <laughs> when I brought those guys home, they would be like, what is, what's with all of these like water, water flowering, what are they called <laughs> in English? What are they even called in English? What? I'm like, I'm reading my language. What? what? Flower of- and watering can? No. What? Whatever it is, you would, it seems like your parents were into plants. <laughs> yeah, I, I just was like, yeah, it's just like in Iran, they, it's like the plant, it's just like a tradition. I just said some ridiculous, like, I, you know, I just waved it away. So I was like, you're not going to last. Why, do, why should I bother explaining all, my entire culture to you? <laughs> but, I mean, I don't, do you, do you still use it? I don't use it. I stopped <laughs> using it. You use it, <laughs> Ario. Are you still using it? Oh, my God. It's the best. It's the we don't have a toilet paper shortage in our household. <laughs> <laughs> On a friendly. 
Ario, <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm very impressed because I got stopped. The I don't know butt of us all. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what age it was, but I stopped. Wait, jo Maz, is that just be just because you you have you're a famous comedian, so you have an actual bidet? Is that it? No, I have a I I I I have a servant who does it for me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> his name his name is Bidet. <laughs> Oh, man. Are you guys are you guys waiting for me to have? Uh, we are uh, waiting for you to give us some thoughts. So, serious, so here's the thing. Answer. It's actually it's actually an uh, interesting concept because even though it's a very funny idea, as a person who is clearly mixed, bridging these two worlds is something I do by design, by purpose, and by destiny. Like that's what I was created to do. So I'm if you're if 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 someone's dating me, I don't care what race they are, they're Persian. You're gonna have to learn how to be Persian, you're gonna take your shoes off, you're gonna say hi to my parents, you're gonna know. I don't even take girls home. I might be married for five years and then be like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, because I, I think you're brave when you take people home, Negin. That was very brave of you. Like, I, I'm just not, I have a little more abiru, like I'm just not taking anyone home. But let's say someone comes over here and is like, why do you have this flower watering can in your home? <laughs> I'm gonna be like, because my butt is a flower and this is what happens in Persian <laughs> homes. And let me explain, because your toilet paper isn't cleaning nothing. You're smearing it around. Let me explain what you're supposed to do, which hands you're supposed to use. And let me explain why we've existed for 5,000 years and you guys are barely, you might not even hit 251. You understand what I'm saying? Like with everything going on right now, let's not, let's not trade tit for tat. So I'm, I'm quick to make all my uh, like non-Persian friends Persian, all my uh, Persian friends black, like I'm quick to do all of that. Don't, I'll explain to you the proper way to eat Popeyes too. Like I will teach you all. <laughs> Love it. I'll, I'll jump in, I'll jump in with a question since everyone's in, in quarantine and has been able to do live shows. Um, I'd love everyone's kind of perspective on kind of the live studio audience. Assuming you make exactly the same amount of money would you rather do a live show in front of a live studio audience for a thousand people or like an Instagram stream show for like 2 million people? Oh, the latter. I'll do the latter. I was doing in the middle of the zoom show. It hit me cause I was Tehran and I, again, we did a zoom show and I was in my shorts. I was in this room. I was doing it. And then I pulled back and I jumped up and I go, guys, I'm in my shorts. I go, guys, if I could do this out of my house, and make a living, I would do it in a, in a heartbeat. Because listen, we love an audience. We love live audiences. Don't get me wrong. Live audience is the best thing. It's like, it's like a drug. You want it. However, the travel, as you get older, you have family and stuff. I don't, I'm like, I, I don't necessarily want to get on a plane and travel and all that other stuff. I, I mean, listen, there's, there's obviously some glamour to it, but you're away from your family. So if I can stay home and do this, of course, no, no question on my end. I mean, Ah, that's a tough one because um, obviously the reach with the two million would be bigger, but I think the enjoyment, the actual quality for the audience is like several hundred times less enjoyable. You know what I mean? Like, you know, when you see a movie, like a really fucking funny movie in the movie theater and there's people around you and you like actually laugh. Like, do you ever really laugh like that when you're home alone? You know what I mean? It's just not the same feeling. It doesn't, it just doesn't land the same. And also like, I'm, I think this quarantine has really been difficult for extroverts like myself. Like I will fucking strike up a conversation with someone at a stop sign. And I'm like that asshole. That's like, Oh, the weather's nice today. Like I love talking about the weather with strangers. Like strangers are like my lifeblood. Um, I'm like a social vampire. So um, the, to like take away interactions has been very, very difficult for me. And Zoom Negan is like, it, 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 it it, it's like a lift. Zoom is like methadone, right? But I'm like, I need heroin. <laughs> so, Megan, Megan, in terms of what you just said, I, I totally get it. But I will say like the difference between, let's say, watching a movie at home where you're going to laugh a little bit and what have you, 
and watching something live, obviously, even laughter in general, this is a secret that some people that aren't in the, in the comedy business don't know, but when you see people closer to each other at a comedy club, you got to see them closer to each other because laughter, it's like a fire. It's, gotta, it's, it, 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 it's contagious. So you, it's you see like them close. It's like a coronavirus. Like a coronavirus, Sorry. exactly. But that said, this whole little interaction of Zoom and Instagram Live or whatever, for me, I have learned, because I was very skeptical at first. I was like, I don't want to do this all the time. But when you start doing it, you go, oh my God, we're in the same boat. And you start hearing people like, as long as you are being vulnerable and honest about what's going on, you're calling a spade a spade. You're like, look, I'm sitting in a chair. I got earbuds on and there's a closet behind me and blah, 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 blah. blah and where and there are people in their beds or whatever. I, I feel like you're right. It's never as good as that live experience in that theater or in that uh, club. But it's actually it fulfills some of that because we're all in it and it's live. It's not that you're putting it up and they're watching it later. They're watching it live. And if you were to say to me, look, you could do this and there's a million people watching live. I could talk to the crowd and all that stuff. Fantastic. So, so Ter Teron, slay, slay, I'm going to slightly modify the question for Teron. I should have modified well, it at the beginning. Well, the, the two million home viewers have had two drinks. Well, it, it's not even that. For me, the reach of two million people is very tempting. And myself, I'm actually, un unlike Negging, I'm actually an introvert. So I'm an introvert, extrovert. So I put on a show when I'm out, but that's why I like to be at home. If I'm watching a movie, I'd rather watch it by myself. However, the you concept and of comedy. You Spears. Britney Spears uh, describes herself that way as well. <laughs> yeah, Britney Spears is also dating a Persian guy. So we got one. So listen. Sam Asghari. What's up, Sam? Oh, uh, Shima knew exactly who that was real quick. Oh. Like, you got the muscles and take off a shirt. All of a sudden, Shima. I'm not Shima saying knows. I won't do that if I saw him. So the concept of it is, I I'm an introvert, extrovert. So while the, however, the luring, um, the luringness of, of 2 million people just to get my reach out there is amazing. But the comedy for me is a connection. When I'm in a room and it's packed, I feel a connection. It, it's like when it, it's almost like a horror crux where Voldemort takes a piece of his soul and puts it in, in, uh, into seven different things. Yeah, I don't have to uh, murder anyone to get this done. I'm giving a piece of my soul ever so slight to the audience, which is why I'm so, uh, so exhausted when I'm done and need to rejuvenate on my own to recharge. I like that. I like having that connection. Fill me up with uh, rooms uh, of a thousand people. This is why you get these bands who tour for 50 years. Like Bono never needs to tour again. It's not like we've heard a new U2 song that we're like, oh, we love this one. They don't need to tour. All these bands, you know, but it's the fact that they love it so much. And that's what I miss a lot. And while social media is the hero we need but don't deserve, I'd rather get the villain of a live show to come back anytime soon. Right. Side, note, side note, I've met Bono. <laughs> that's, also, side note, I want to point out, I don't have a family or, or kids or even a bidet like Moz. So it's a lot different <laughs> for me to be on the road. It's, it's, it's different. When you're different, like Maz is at a great plateau in his career. And so I'm still still like getting there where I, you know, trying to achieve half of what it what what he has. All right. We're gonna make this a little bit coronavirus theme, but not in a sad way. So we're all in quarantine, and I think a lot of us, including myself, are very bored. And so we're gonna ask you what is your favorite quarantine activity but you cannot use the words TikTok in your answer not a problem um <laughs> <laughs> i have not reached the TikTok phase of my quarantine um i think the bet like if you're looking for a way to really pass the time, I suggest a 17 month old toddler uh, because they will just like eat up your entire freedom uh, when there's no childcare. It is just all toddler all the time, uh, which, and, and so I'm like so desperate to go out 
and get on a plane again and do shows so I can get away from my baby. I mean, she's fantastic. Um, but also, oh my God. But uh, no, so I feel like my quarantine has been, people are talking about fucking starter dough kits and shit like that. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a dream. My quarantine is so laborious. Like all I do is make sure that this, you know, child doesn't kill herself, which she clearly wants to do all the time. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, I'm sorry. I wish I had a better answer for like what for something fun um but uh it's just been um it's a, been a rough one here at the farsad tottenham household well you know i got bitten by a tick but let me talk um <laughs> no wait wait that. we need a shout out to the moms here after that we need a shout out to all the moms on this <laughs> No, 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 no. We need a shout out to that toddler. Where's the baby? Can you bring the baby in? Can we see the baby? It's 9 45 in New York City. She is sleeping. Take the camera. I love sleeping babies are the best babies. <laughs> sleeping yeah, babies, you're like, oh. You're so that's when again. she's really fantastic. <laughs> By the way, she's, um, she, Tehran, she's a, a Bluranian. That's what's up. Is her name Tehran? Her name. <laughs> <laughs> and if the I answer's no, too. then. Yo, let me explain something real quick to Negin and everyone on the chat before Maz tells us what his favorite thing. I invented being black and Persian. I'm letting you all know that now. I don't care if there are people that are older than me. I don't care about any of that. Actually, a lot of you might not even know this. If you know who the Hughes brothers are, Negin and Maz might be familiar. They did the movie Minister Society, Alan Hughes, very big director. They've directed a lot of, a lot of big movies. I get this call to come into Alan Hughes's office. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Maybe he's gonna offer me a role in his next thing. Um, uh, Albert and Alan Hughes are like huge. They've done so many movies that Presidents from Hell, Book of Eli. I'm like, yo, I'm gonna get a new role. I go in there and Alan Hughes is there and he's like, oh, Tehran, it's such a, uh, such a pleasure to meet you. And I'm like, you too, Mr. Hughes, I've seen all your stuff. He's like, yeah, I've seen your stuff too. I'm black, I'm black and Iranian too. My mom's, my mom's Armenian Persian and, I, and my dad's black. And I was like, you called me here to tell me you're Persian? Like you could have easily DM me. Like I didn't need to come in for that. I, I, I'm just like, Yara knows all of you. So let your little, little sleeping girl know, Negin, I invented this. I you invented just like, <laughs> I'm just letting you, you know. really put a toddler in her place. That's because everyone, all of a sudden, everyone's <laughs> black and Iranian. All of a sudden, everyone's black and Iranian. When I was coming up, nobody was black and Iranian. Now, all of a sudden, my gardener is like, I'm like, Jose. He's like, actually, <laughs> it's Jafar. I'm black it's, and Iranian. It's, like, you're black it's and Hussein. Iranian. Yes. It's not Jose, it's Hossein. Exactly. You want to quickly credit your parents, though, for no. being the ones who, like, had to awkwardly be like, this is my boyfriend, this is my girlfriend, nobody likes it. <laughs> what? When my parents had, were, when they got married, actually, it's very interesting. In the Iranian diaspora, racism is a very new concept. It's not something that was older because Iran as a country is a very diverse country with a multitude and range of different racial um, connotations all within the, the confirmation of being Iranian. So people will always be like, oh, people from the South are black. Yeah, but I'm black American. It's very different. So race wasn't a big thing until later. So becoming a minority then trying to oppress another minority in order to basically prove themselves and then of, uh, finding like, oh, well, black people are this, white people are this, uh, is something that's actually much newer. Before it was based on culture. Oh, your culture is this, you're Afghan, you're Indian. But now with race is a new concept. And my parents- I'd be curious, so Tara, I'd be curious to see what your mom thought the first time your dad showed her Haji Firuz. <laughs> and black face. you know everyone like it's once again this is something new western civilization uh, and the 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 concepts of racial and social constructs within the west shouldn't have to specifically apply to iran or iranians like it's only blackface because of american blackface there is no concept of it specifically in iran the only thing that does exist is now that we're aware of it 
Don't act like it's not a thing. That's all I suggest is like, now that we're aware of it, now that we're socially, can be socially responsible, uh, it's time. There's this saying in Farsi that's actually one of my favorite things. It's, Kesi ke khabe, میشه بیدار کرد. باید کسی که خودشو میزنه به خواب هیچ وقت بیدار نمیشه. Which means someone who's, who's asleep, you can wake up. But someone who's pretending to be asleep will never be woken. So we are all no longer asleep. If we're turning a blind eye to things, it's because we're simply pretending to be asleep. Tehran, I want to I thank you for bringing up Donald Trump at this point. Um, <laughs> listen. He is asleep, head in the sand, uh, and some persons like him, but that's their problem. Let's move on. Next question. <laughs> so, since since uh, since Saran dropped some wisdom, I guess uh, for for Maza Negin, what's your favorite like ridiculous Persian phrase? My favorite ridiculous Persian phrase, Negin, what you got? No, it's, that's such a tough question because I feel like I, I love a lot of them, but I don't like use them. Um, it, I find myself strangely like translating some things sometimes in English that don't, where people are like, what? Like the other day, um, and you guys know the expression like, you know, like really watch that thing like a hawk or whatever. That's mm -hmm. in English you would say like, you know, you better watch that thing like a hawk or whatever you would say. And I saw, so I was just like, yeah, look at that thing with 10 eyes. I was like, look at that thing with 10 eyes. And they're like, what? What do you mean? And I was like, you know, with a bunch of eyes, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I find myself doing those stupid little expressions, um, all the, you know, translating them into English in, a, in weird ways. Well, it's interesting when you break it down. There's a lot of like, I would die for you. It really means may you die. May they put dirt on your head. Those are all great. When you break it all down, you're like, oh, no, that means, oh, that means kill the guy. Ooh, like there's a lot of <laughs> killing and dying in our expressions. That's, of course, official. It's like choke. Like to choke. How about like, kuft? Kuft. Cool. Shut up, but may you choke. Um, I would, I would go either sadet bu warm sabzi mide, or which is your head smells like warm sabzi, or mush to surach nemirap jaru be domesh mibas, which is like the the mouse wouldn't go in the hole, but would tie the broom to its uh, the the broomstick to its tail. I love, I love Persian sayings. Yeah, we got some good like those, those of us who don't know what those mean, those two mean. <laughs> so, um, I, I and I have to explain to my friends what mush to surach nemirav jaru vidomesh mibas like the mouse won't go into the hole, but would tie would tie the um, broomstick to its tail is when basically you you're not in somewhere. For example, if you can't, you're not really the one getting someone into the club but then you're the one bringing like a bunch of guys with you to the club on top of you not getting into the club. And you're the extra, like you're, you're doing the most right now. Like you're not even in that position yet and you're trying to do extra. Wait, can what's you say- What's the Gourmet Sabzi one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never got that one. Hold on, has no one heard Kalat Bukhor Masabzi Mide? No. Hold on, hold on, where's- I think that may just be like in your house. No, no, that's not true. Layla, are your parents there? Yeah, they're here. Have they heard this? Yes, of course we hear it. Exactly. Look, if you guys need me to come teach you all Farsi, what up? I'm going to put Farsi That's a compliment, right? Yes, that's amazing. Ask your mom. I want your mom. I want to hear what your mom- no, it's not. Thank you. Like no, it's not. <laughs> what is your mom? Ask your mom. I would I love to... to smell like warm sabzi. <laughs> no, no. Kalat to warm sabzi. Me is like you're you're being extra. You're 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 dirty right now. Like you're full no, no, of no, yourself. Yeah, you're you're being you're you're. You're, you're full of yourself. She said exactly, exactly in a very nice way. She said it. <laughs> it's so strange it's like in english that would be like i don't know you smell like a chicken casserole what it's like a <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> and then you make hormesabzi that happens your head will smell like hormesabzi i promise yeah. 
<laughs> Layla's mother, when you You're don't like a loving if, person who cooks for your family. <laughs> uh, also, my body odor, if I don't put on deodorant, it, I start smelling like a sabzi. So, zira bagalam bu gurbe sabzi mi de. Oh. Um, I have one question for you guys. Um, the the more serious question, but I think it's a really interesting one. How, how have um, for all three of you, what have been some kind of major failures that you've had to overcome um, to get to where you are? I have never failed, so I'll go ahead. And you go ahead. Whatever you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the question is when have what to talk about our failures? <laughs> failures that you've overcome. I mean, like just it, it's I mean, have we overcome? It's like every it's like being um an ethnic person in Hollywood has just from the very beginning been uh a real difficult path. I mean, I, you know, my first, uh, I remember going to an audition and the first time I got a call back, it was for a commercial and the commercial, it was like a casino commercial. And I was, um, I was uh, auditioning for like the part of someone standing in the background clapping. And um, I got called back and they were like, oh, you know, the cast members, you're so good. You're, you're so good. And I was like, thank you, like, I've been practicing my clapping. Um, and, uh, and they were like, but you're just a little too ethnic for this part. And if we go that route, you're not ethnic enough. Um, and so, uh, you know, to which I was just like, oh, I've got bronzer in my purse, like, will that do? You know, um, but they, that's kind of been, um, an issue, I mean, for me from the very beginning is just like they don't know how to place me. Um, and I think a lot of just generally ethnic people, they don't, you know, they're like, well, they're not the like quirky neighbor next door or could they be? I don't know. Like, it's like, it, it, it is only changed in the last, like, I don't know, if Maz and Tehran, you agree, maybe in the last like three or four years where they're now really, uh, like more openly bringing on like brown people onto shows. So I think that's been, I don't know, I don't know if it's, it's a failure, but it's like some, it's like, a, I guess my failure is that I wasn't a white person. So that's, the <laughs> um, and I overcome it and I overcame it by just like being persistent and, um, and just continuing to like, be like, no, I will insist on being in this business. I will, I will say this based off of that. It's, it's pretty simple. Failures, there's going to be a ton of failures. No matter what you do, you want to start a, a, a company, you're going to fail. You're going to clothing line, you're going to fail. You could be a singer, you're going to fail. You could be an artist, you're going to fail. You could be a doctor, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You know, there's going to be a, the, the question becomes, that's why it goes back to what I said earlier, finding what you love to do. Because I tried two, three, four different things, sometimes pushed by my parents, sometimes thinking that I was finding the compromise. And when I would get into those things, the, the different careers I tried, as soon as I had a moment of not succeeding, I was like, you know what, I'm done with this. And I would leave. This was the first time with stand-up comedy where... You're at the comedy club. You're supposed to get on at 11 o'clock. Then a famous person comes in. They go, I'm going to do an hour. Now you're going to get on at 12. Then another famous person comes in. Now it's one. Then the audience leaves. Now there's one audience member left. Now it's 1.45. The club's closing at 2. Do you go on stage in front of three drunk tourists or one drunk tourist? Or do you go home? And because it was what I loved doing, I said, I'm going to go. I'm going to keep going. And so those were failure moments, as Negin said, how many auditions did you do? You didn't get it. How many times did they tell you do this, do that? When you find what you love doing, failure is not a problem because it's not a failure. It's like, oh, that's cool. I got another one out of the way. I got another one out of the way. So find what you love doing because you're going to fail. I think young people a lot of times are afraid of failing. Oh, my mom's going to say this. My dad's going to say that. I got a D. I got an F. The business, they didn't invest in my business or whatever. No, it's going to happen. But you get up again, you go, I'm going the next day. I'm going. To, when I see perseverance, 
that's where you see success. And I love seeing that sometimes my kids will get into like an art project or something and they keep going. And I think to myself, oh, wow, that's good. It's the drive. Somebody did a TED talk on this. It was all about resiliency and grit. It's not about Angela how Duckworth. great you are. What's, what's her name? Angela Duckworth. I think was it, it is. Yeah. So it's all about grit. It's not that when they look at kids, it's not about being the valedictorian straight A's. None of that crap means anything. No offense, Harvard, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> plenty of people went to Harvard and ended up doing nothing. And plenty of people went to community college and changed the world. So just find what you love doing and do it. Um, we got a little, like, I, you know, in, in, in the three of us have probably seen so many comedians from the very beginning when we started to now. And the only reason that they're professional comedians is because they just didn't quit. You know what I mean? Like, just, they just didn't get weeded out. Like, that's kind of, I think, how it is across professions. If you just don't get weeded out, then you end up being a professional in your, you know, in your career. Well, when it comes to failure, my Bubba, who's watching this, was like, Hart Fadon said it, you're still a failure. Well, thank you, Bubba Jim. Let me just say. <laughs> no, my, my, actually, it's funny. My parents are very loving and supportive. So, um, you know, they, uh, Negin and Ma spoke to failure. What I'll talk about is like, the, I remember specifically this one time that I, I bombed. And I'll, I'll never forget, it was at the Rap Factory. It was on a Friday night. It was packed. I was very new, like maybe not even a year in, a year at the most. A young and hungry Chris D'Elia went on. And at this time, Dane Cook, who was like the man there, Dane Cook would come in. And I know this, he would come in basically to bump everybody and just go on. And, I, and Dane's always been very kind to me, but I knew I would watch him do this. This one time, Chris D'Elia got on before Dane. Chris D'Elia did an amazing 30 minutes, got a standing ovation as he was finishing. And Dane came in a little late. And Dane turned to me and said, Tehran, you're up next. And I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared to go on. I had just come there because I would love to go there and just watch everybody. I had just moved to LA. And he's like, Tehran, you're up next. And before I could protest or say no or whatever it is, the host, Fraser Smith, calls me up. I go up there and for five minutes, just crickets, which is worse than booze. I would rather have someone had thrown a tomato at me because then there was a reaction. And even to the point where when I was getting off, someone went, some, it was so quiet. Someone was like, nice try. And that was it, right? <laughs> and then Dane Cook went up and killed. And <laughs> that was like this time that I bombed. And you know what I learned? I learned always be ready, always be prepared. I was never going to have that happen to me again. I was never going to go through that again. And I was never going to be unprepared again. So that was a major turning point in my comedy career, where it was the flight or, flight or fight. I could have went home. It was devastating. But then you realize in comedy, there's always tomorrow night. And I went up and I was put in a very similar position and I killed. And I was like, I'm always going to be ready. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Sahar, one last question for yeah. the for the three of you, and then we'll let you all go. Yeah, so um, one of uh, the fans asked, uh, your favorite and least favorite things about the LA Persian community? We're curious to know about. <laughs> My favorite thing about the LA Persian community. And, 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 and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna play a little music for the outro yeah. as well. Uh -huh. My favorite thing about the LA Persian community is Tehran. And my least favorite thing about the Persian community. <laughs> Is that how we're going? No, there's good people here, man. And there's great restaurants. You should go to Rafi's place when it opens again. You should go to Dario when it opens again. There's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things. And I really don't don't have a least favorite. I mean, you know, I mean, whatever. There's some, there's some pretentiousness once in a while. But those people, you know, every community has it. The Russians have it. The Indians have it. We have it. And what are you going to do? Just got to smile and be like, hey, congratulations on the yellow Lamborghini or whatever you got. <laughs> I live in New York City. So um, it's funny because I still feel very much like a tourist when I go to, I mean, I grew up in Palm Springs. So you'd think like I would have some kind of, connection. I mean, I very, I have very little connection to the Persian community in Los Angeles. 
um, except but like when I go there, like I go to, you know, the Persian, I go to Vesvud, you know what I mean? I have some, some good food. I go to the shops. Um, but I, uh, like I do, I think that I, I went to this, this, um, the Beverly Hills gardens once, um, I was like killing time. My agents are over there. And um, they, and I remember being like, oh my God, there's so many Persians here with so many butt implants. It was like out of control levels of butt implants. And I don't know if that's like uh, endemic to the entire Persian community of Los Angeles, but if so, I would say your butts are great and like cool it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when that you said, Sabsi, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I apply when, that correctly to her? <laughs> when you said, when you said, um, you were gonna play a song, I was hoping it's like, you don't know me, don't ever think, think you know me. I was hoping you rock out. That's my jam. Like, I don't care. People are hating on that song. I, I, I think it's it's great. My my least favorite, uh, my least favorite part about the LA Persian community is this girl named Parisa. I hate her. But then on the flip side, my favorite is also another girl named Parisa. So Parisa's win. Uh, Which is, is the question. Uh -huh. We'll leave unanswered. Well, but it really comes down to the concept of, the concept of it is, while there are a lot of negative stereotypes, my least and favorite are going to be the Shahs of Sunset. Like at the same time as people hate these stereotypes, it's part of acclamation. No one said anything when we had a Jersey Shore. This is what it's like. This is when you're just, it's its about them. And if you wanted to say anything about LA Persians, just remember Maz Dabrani, who's like one of the best people I've ever met is also an LA Persian. And there are a lot of people like that. So I, I'm enjoying LA. And I love the fact that there's so many Persians when we go places. I'm from Washington DC originally, and we made being Persian like very cool there. And here it's just, it is a thing, you know? Amazing. Thank you all so much for your time. I think we all have to dance out of here now. Um, be sure everyone to follow all of them on social media and you can catch us on our website. Hope we see you at future Chai Time events. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs>